In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Morning. Not sure how many people uh, watch the uh, the fire the fire uh, what do you call last night fire work yeah <laughs> I, I'm still working in my sermon so <laughs> um, realize um, you are now uh, go through well not everyone I think not every text and verses but the epistles of the Colossians. I, let me let me let me tell you something. Um, Colossians is uh, to me is a it's quite challenging. It's because it's really talk about Christology, and uh, if you try to understand Jesus Christ, uh, Colossians would be a very good book to really dig deep to understand. And by understanding, then you will have a strong faith, I hope. But having said that, uh, Colossians is very difficult in, the, in some ways. Now, if you follow what just we have read, uh, chapter 1, I don't know whether you realize the Greek actually translated in English. It's more complicated, right? It's a very long uh, sentence, and every sentence... They have different clauses, and every clause has some very important meaning. So that's why when I try to think about how to preach, it's far difficult than, you know, the gospel preaching. Those are story, those are simple and direct, straightforward in a, in a way. But here you look at the epistle, you feel that, all right? So... I, but I want you to turn to the Bible, and uh, if you not look at the scripture, you don't follow me, and you're lost. But here, as I say, um, this morning, I think, when you look at this, reading the scripture as a spiritual food nurturing, then I'll picture, here, we are going to have a steak meal. You know what is a steak meal? It's heavy. It's rich, it's juicy, but it's not like a light, a light breakfast, you know, continental breakfast. I assume that continental is light. And, uh, you know, maybe just a milk and uh, oaks and that's it, or fruit. But here it's not. It's something, something very important, a solid food. So I just want you to understand like myself, prepare for this sermon, I spend a lot of time reading <laughs> and understanding and try to, um, the next thing is how to present it so that uh, you can understand uh, easily and take it home and uh, practice in your daily life. So here we go, so I uh, try my best and uh, to, know, to, to do what I do. Now, um, do I have the topic and uh, the words? And um, actually, I try to uh, pick up uh, verses uh, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, and the topic uh, is like this: through toil and suffering, I am asked to bring the newborn Christians into the maturity of faith as gifts presented to Christ. If you look this carefully, it's follow actually verse 28. Verse 28. So I pick up the verse 28 as the whole uh, central focus. And uh, with that, I'll try to put this text instead of, I think, last two times, it should be touched on Christology, the divinity of Christ, the incarnation of Christ and so on. And uh, those are ontolo what we call the ontological doctrine. Uh, that's a very important thing. You look at the, for example, Apostle Creed, Nicene Creed. Those are solid things. Those are faith you're going to confess every week and in your baptism 
That's why you confess what you believe, and those are very important things. But having said that, as I say, it's very solid, and sometimes you feel dry if you un- you don't understand what it is, because they are not story. Okay. So, but I turn this text and then focus into a more pastoral concern instead of doctrine, like I hope last two times you, you, you touch on it. And uh, that's a, what the pastoral concern, the pastoral concern, you look at the topic, basically, there's many, there are a few things very important. Let's talk about God suf- uh, poor suffering. It talks about he is asked to bring the newborn Christians. Now, that includes Colossians, Colossian Christians. Bring them to where? Bring them up into mature of faith. Okay. Now, but having said that, there is a goal. The goal is to present to Christ. In other words, uh, you go to a party and you're going to give a, a, a gift, a presence. That's why you prepare that for the party, for the host, for someone you want to, you're being invited and you want to see. And here, the person is Jesus Christ. So in other words, Paul is preparing himself to present Colossians, including to Christ. Now, as we go through, then you also have to think about it's not just Paul responsibility or Paul, this call to Paul. It's going to be a call to all of us here. As a pastor, yes. As a Sunday school teacher, yes. As a youth counselor, yes. As a Christian, you bring people to Christ. You're also obliged to do the same thing. So don't look at it just, oh, okay, it's about Paul, it's not about me. No. Paul, I was going to talk about as an example, lay down to Colossians, every Christian, and beyond Colossians, every, every, um, uh, every Christian. You should already know that Paul never go to Colossian church. He never, he never met Christian over there. But he is the pastor of them. That's what Paul looked at himself. He's the minister of the word. He's the apostle called by Jesus, a mission to the Gentiles. So those are his sheep. Those are his sheep. And he has a heavy responsibility because he need to present this ship of Christ back to God to Christ now that's that's what we mean when we meant and that's why Paul said I neighbor so hard all my life throughout my life day and night every month Every year until he died. So having said that, then you know, this is a message. This is a, the, mess, the text of the message. It's talking about the growth of a Christian, right? Into mature faith. And then also talking about the growth of a church. It's not single individual. It's about collectively a community. As I say, Paul never, uh, most of the biblical scholars believe Paul never uh, went to Colossae. But it's through his co-workers. And one of the co-workers' name is Ephorus. And he might be just like what we today say is an evangelist. But look at that is a teamwork. That is not an individual work. That's what Anglican Church believe. We are in Catholic Church. 
And so we have house of bishops, the house of clergy, and house of lay. We are not talking just a local church. We are talking a church of Christ. And so Paul worked so close with Ephesus, and he came maybe to report and share his struggle with Paul. But the time Paul was in prison, it's a tough time. But Paul was still working so hard and thinking about those Christians, even though he didn't know them in faith, he prayed for them. The the fact is, why Ephesus came to talk to, uh, about the people, the Colossian, is because they. Foresee that in the very near future there are going to be influence and impact by the culture, the secular culture at that time, the Greek culture, and、uh, the upcoming of the culture. For example, there are name big name is Gnosticism. Now I'm not going to talk about this today. And also, you might heard the name also legalism from Judaism. So it's a combination of different defected belief. Defected means there may be some true, there may be some wrong. They all the time mix up. So it's coming. Actually, it's coming, and they can foresee what happened in another year or another five year or another ten years. We should. Understand what does that mean? For thirty years ago, the anger of the anger of, of Canada, in a way, is still very biblical and orthodox. In thirty years, they defect their faith. They turn to away from the Scripture and away from God. Now you look at what happened. It's not just the anger of Canada. It's the United Church. It's the Lutheran Church. And as far as I know, there are also some Baptist churches in the United States. And I have a very good friend who actually is the high leader of the Alliance Church. Said to me six months ago, said the same thing. The church is also under the attack. Well, because of the attack, it's from the culture. Because people are actually daily educated. And work in the society, and they are being engaged and influenced. And so Paul foresee those dangers coming, coming, and so warn them not to drift along. Otherwise, they're going to be lost. Just like remember what Jesus said in his parable of seed and sower. The seed fell among the thorns, or on the thin soil, or along the roadside, to be devoured by the birds. They're gone. So that's what Jesus warned his disciples, and now Paul warned the Colossians. The same thing in in church history, we are always being challenged. Because we are not away from the world, we are in the world to preach the gospel and live our life. That's ongoing struggle on and off all the time happen, and that's why go back to say we need community. You cannot survive by your own. You cannot survive by your own family. You cannot lock your children inside your family. There's no way because we have internet. The internet. Enter directly into your home without your guard. So basically, after in chapter one,、um, half of the chapter one, finishing about the supremacy of Christ, Saint Paul actually want to highlight. What we know in doctrine, Christ, His starters, everything about that, we need to apply 
in our Christian life. We need to put our faith into practice. And the key words is we have to be obedient to Christ in his teaching. We follow the second part. Whatever you know in knowledge, you just become a head knowledge. You better be a head knowledge Christian. But you might not be a Christian in life. So that's the concern of St. Paul. So Paul, in order to run up and anchor his readers, not to upload in the air, in faith, in thought, in knowledge, he tried to ground it. How can he able to do that? He do it by this. He set a target for the Colossians. We are going to present ourselves to Christ, holy, blameless, and above reproach in mature Christian faith when we meet Christ in eternity, verse 22b and 28b, twice. So he set a target. This is all we are going to do and we are going to ask for and going to be accountable. Christianity is a religion of God talking about accountability. Accountability. We have to the Lord will ask us, what have you done for me in your life as I give you a lot of gifts? We have to be accountable. And so Paul set the target. And then he also gave them a promise. They, you are not working alone. I'm not setting a target and you have to do it by yourself on your own and scare you to death. No, here he said, I am the minister of Christ. Well, why, 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 what did he say? He wanted to tell them, you are not alone. I'm working with you. I'm your shepherd. I'm your pastor. I'm working with you, even though you don't know me. You never met me. But we are in the same boat. We are walking forward in our same journey of faith. So we are brothers and sisters. There are many, many saints in history. When, we, when I read books, St. Augustine, for example, he read many good books and inspired me. Like Paul, we never met. But I'm sure one day in eternity, when I met St. Augustine, he would be my close friend. So let's look at the verses 21, 23, the call of transformation. To set the goal to be holy, blameless, and above reproach, we need to have a life, to have a life motive, ceaseless passion, and the right, man, uh, uh, and the right mind to sustain. But where do these spiritual forces come from? How does the transformation happen? St. Paul then points us back to our conversion. Conversion is the mark of life's transformation through the work of the Holy Spirit on us. But having said that, St. Paul also reminds another very important thing. Transformation is a result of Jesus' work of redemption on the cross. That's what in verse 22a he said, Jesus has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. Well, by the, in his body means he's incarnated. He, he's a man. He died on the cross. In other words, it's a gift. Jesus died for us on the cross, 
finish the work of reconciliation. Now, anything you have done so that make that work finished? No. It's Christ initiate, Christ fulfill, and then Christ give you this gift to you so that we are being reconciled with God and with the people. So it's a gift, it's a grace. In other words, we cannot do the transformation entirely by ourselves. We are invited to be involved, yes, but it is initiated and coached by the Holy Spirit. It's not so magical, you know, I mean, it's so, not so abstract, because as a Christian in your baptism and in your early Christian life, you should experience this kind of grace and gift and change. One thing very simple, before conversion, you should be not so sensitive to sins. There are some people who say, hey, I don't have sins. Why I need gospel, you know? They are not sensitive. But after the conversion, being baptized, you start to be very sensitive. Because every time you did something wrong, there's a voice to tell you, hey, you're doing something wrong against God. That's why sometimes when people came to the worship and they feel very guilty, because when they reveal the past week, they did something terribly against God, and they feel strong sense of guilt and shame. So who did that? Who spoke to you? Who continued to speak to you? It's the Holy Spirit. Because in your conversion, your baptism, God promised the Holy Spirit in dwell in you. And so every day, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, whether you listen or not. Or you can shut down your ears. But the Holy Spirit never gives you up. Continue to speak to you. And that's why, if I can allow me to say Christians, should have a stronger sense of guilty feeling. Because you have the Spirit accompany with you and help you to remind what is right and what is wrong ethically and morally. That's the promise given by Jesus' word. The Spirit is a Spirit of truth. That's what it means. But then you might ask me, then why so many Christians fail to be transformed? Now, Paul, in answering of these questions, very wisely help us to look back our conversion, particularly beginning from the pre-conversion, which means that before you become a Christian. And he names three things as an example. One is, the first one is alienated. Now, the word alienated, is not, I don't know, I, I, I remember in the United States, if they look at the immigrant outside America, they call them what? Aliens, right? <laughs> I feel very, very uncomfortable. That's why I'm not Americans. But the alienated word is coming from the Judaism, the Jewish people, to denote Pagans who are usually caught up in the trap of idolatry and therefore who are slavery to sin under the divine law, the Old Testament, the uh, Ten Commandments. That's how they describe the word, the use of the word in the Old Testament, alienated. So in other words, when Paul used that word, he tries to associate and engage with the collusion with his people around them. They call him alienated. Then Paul tried to remind those people, the Gentile Christians, the Colossians, before you became a Christian, you should know what is idolatry in Greek culture. Well, for today, 
We also have the today's trap of idolatry. And give you an example is the addiction of browsing the internet. I don't know how many hours you spend in the internet in the past and now. Be watchful. When we brought up our children, we were really concerned about TV. But right now it's about internet. If you keep the children in, inside the room, they do the internet, you are going to kill them. You're going to kill them. You should know. And also the shameless addiction in web porn. Don't tell me it is not our addiction. Don't tell me it's not a seduction. I, some, I, I want somehow to talk to about this. I hear a lot of reports in U.S. It's shocking. It's almost number one issue now among the youth work and adults and even pastors. So that alienated reflect the capture by the current pop and sex addict culture. The second thing is about the hostile in mind. It means and strange and hostile to God in their thinking, reflected in their cast of mind. Now, in 19th century, a very famous uh, German philosopher, Nietzsche, he declared that God is dead. And ever since, the Western culture has become a secularized culture which doesn't believe that God exists. You go out, Vancouver City, make a check. How many people believe in God? You may, uh, large, they say, they say, no. I don't know whether today you go to university, you know, psychology class, usually the first class, the professor asks, how many Christians are there? And they try to challenge and confront Christians in terms of Christian faith, God existence. That's what we encounter it. When I was a college student, I don't know whether to see a movie, you know, uh, Will Smith. Where I like this movie so much. I'm a legend. Have you seen that? It's talking about zombie. I like zombie. Um, the was were zombie due to the disease infection, and then they have no solution, even this uh, ground zero. And then Will, Will, Will Smith declare and shout, to himself and people around. Well, there's a, there's a, there's a woman there. He, and he said, there is no God. It hit in my heart. I think it hit a lot of people when they watch the movie. There is no God. And I think there's an illustrated example what Paul said, hostile in mind to God. We have more and more atheists believe. Third, evil work. Now, Paul used this word, t term, evil word, is a visible word, it's a visible, sorry, it's a visible work in sinful behavior, manifest from the inside darkness, which leads to death, signify a broken alien relationship with God and with people. What does that mean? It means that those are not abstract thing, inside thing. When talk about evil work, it's outside, visible. Everybody see it. And then the best example today, perhaps, is the shooting in the United States, in campus, in the community, one after the other. It's a evil work. And you see the invasion of Ukraine openly. And I, my person will be very clear, this is an evil work. So Paul measures of the alien to hostile mind evil work. His intention is to remind us before we believe in Christ, we are hopeless, sadless, and lifeless in society. Sin calls us into brokenness with relationship with people. And that's 
the reason, the turning point, we are suffer because of sins so desperate, and that's why we repent and turn to God for His salvation. That's the reason we become a Christian. That's the reason we said to God, we're no longer a sinner. We turn to you. Forgive us and save us. On returning back to God, Paul then in Romans 12, 1, 2, very familiar text you, you read all the time. He said, I appeal to you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not, conform, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Wow. You compare the set goal, we just said, you know, Paul said, to be holy, blame, blameless, and above reproach presented to God. They are more or less the same, isn't it? You see the similarity over there, they come from the same offer. That's what Paul said. This was Paul set the goal for Colossian as well as in Roman. He's doing the same thing. To ask a Christian to be transformed. And the driving force is to pursue the holiness because God is holy. So that when we are being presented in Christ in the parousia, in the second coming of Christ, we are irreproachable. Jesus Christ said, my sin, my, my blood wash all these children, their sins, the darkness away. Wipe them off. That's why you come to the Holy Communion. That's the Holy Communion set. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ to transform your life. So Paul said, don't give it up. Even though you're wrestling, you're struggling, but don't give it up. Because at the end of the day, God will carry you through. Then Paul keeps saying that, I became a minister. As I say, Paul sent this message, you are not alone, I am with you. Then Paul go to the second part of the text here. A little bit more difficult. But very important. I put it, the second part is, um, if the first, first part is call of transformation, the second part is Paul as an, as an exemplary exam, exam, example to the Colossians, verses 24, 29. Now you have to remember by heart that uh, when Paul wrote the letter to Colossians, where did he write? Where did he write? At home? At school? No. He wrote it from prison. So, Paul was a pastor, but he was also a prisoner. Now, I don't know whether you know any bishop who is also a prisoner. I know some of the bishop in Islam world, in uh, South Africa, you know, very famous archbishop. He was been prisoned. He become a prisoner. So Colossian people are very, by uh, under, you know receiving a letter from Paul and very must be a feeling very intimidated and in fear. Are we going to be a prisoner too? Because we are Christians. Are we going to end up with the same consequence? So that's why Paul. In verse 24, immediately come, go into by saying, I rejoice in my suffering for your sake. Now, I read it again. I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. So that's why the patristic, in the patristic, in the early church, you know, those non Christian thinkers, all the time criticizing Christianity, is mad. It's unthinkable. 
It's a religion we cannot accept because why those people say, I rejoice in my suffering? Paul explained. Because Paul was in prison, it's not because of his criminal behavior. Just because he preached the gospel to the Gentiles. And preaching to the Colossians, like writing a letter to him, to them, is also part of the reason for his imprisonment. But St. Paul is called by Christ to proclaim the gospel to all nations. For St. Paul, as Jesus is apostle, when the gospel is effectively and fruitfully preached among the Gentiles, he is happy and joyful despite his sufferings of imprisonment. Very simple analogy, you know, a mother, you know, bear a child and give birth and, and the child crying day and night. It's very tough, right? Sleepless night for a week, for a month, for three months. Oh, the bad thing is for six months, right? Have you heard about that? I heard about that. I know some people gone through their journey. Those are pains and suffering. But the mother was happy when he see when she see her child grown up. He forgot all the pains and suffering. That's what Paul said the same thing right here. And so when he talked about this, he used two words. One in English translated is suffering. The second word he used is affliction. Now what are those words in difference? The first word, suffering, Paul used it as the suffering of Paul. In other words, his own suffering. The second word, affliction, is used for the affliction of Christ. He's trying to separate his suffering and the suffering of Jesus. Now we look at the suffering of Christ first, the word. It carries special meaning. It carries the meaning of the implication of the apocalyptic conception in the end time. And in Jude Judaism, it is also called the woes of the Messiah. Now let me clarify that. You look at the chapter 1 and chapter 2, you see there's a lot of this kind of wordings, language coming from the apocalyptics. What, is, what, what, what are you talking? Give you example, verse 26. The mystery previously hidden, but now revealed it. And then verse 27. The riches of the glory of this mystery. And chapter 2, verse 2, God's mystery. And you can go on and find those languages. So why in the Colossians right here have so many apocalyptic languages? It's because Paul is talking about we are entering into an end time. And so when we enter in the, in the end time in the Old Testament, they usually associate with the term woe of the Messiah, the affliction of the last days. And they talk about a lot of, of those kind of afflictions. So in the Old Testament it said, those afflictions are inevitable suffering for God's righteousness. For those who are faithful and obey to God. So who are they? The first one is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And the, sec and the rest will be the followers of the Messiah. So that, is, that means the Christians. That means the church. So in that sense, it means that at the end date, which means in between Jesus' first resurrection and his coming back again, that's what, what we call the end time, the church, the Christian, will enter into suffering. And the word using Paul is using afflictions. The affliction refer back to the Old Testament. And so the Old Testament you study, you understand what Paul is talking about. It's talking about the, the suffering of the Messiah. 
and his people. So it's a pre- so suffering with Christ is a pre- prerequisite to be in glory with him. But none of this affliction is able to separate the believer from the love of God in Jesus Christ. All Christians ultimately will be led to hope and glory. That is the assurance given that such afflictions of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory to be revealed. I give you a very condensed thing. Those are the whole thing in the Old Testament and the New Testament epistles. When we, how we look at suffering. Because through suffering, God is being glorified. That's keep talking in St. John Gospel by Jesus Christ. And in Pauline, a lot of epistles talk about the suffering. Why Jesus, uh, uh, Paul want, uh, devote to, 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 to be suffer for Christ. Because he know that it's the wills of God. And this is a journey we have to go through. But throughout the suffering, Paul said, I'm, I'm, I, I'm very joyful because I see the fruit, the Christian coming into maturity and faith. And I see that in the end day, when we come to the eternity, when I present these people to Christ, I'm happy. I'm happy. That is what Paul said. I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. What do you mean? Because Christ being already ascended and the church history and the New New Testament church continue, the Holy Spirit leading the, the Christians the suffering continue. And that's what Paul said, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction. In other words, we share Christ's afflictions as our sufferings. So then he explained, Paul was now in prison and suffered for Christ. The more the poor suffer, the less the Colossians had to endure. Because he was suffering also for the sake of the well-being of the Colossians as a missionary to the Gentiles. Then Paul said, because of this, I suffer, I'm being in prison. I also suffer for you. As our Lord Jesus Christ suffered for Paul and for us. On the cross. Verse 25. I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that has been given to me for you. To make the word of God fully long, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now we will to his saints. Who is the saints? The Gentile. Who are the Gentile? Colossian. And many people, not Jewish, including you and me. So Paul is speaking to you today too. For suffer also for you. And that's how he voiced out his pastoral care. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all the wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. And for this, I told struggling with all his of his energy that he powerfully works within me. Let me finish it in my short conclusion. What St. Paul said is, is if in Jesus' words it's simply just like this deny yourself take up the cross and follow me. Referring back to our baptism and conversion, we are asked to deny ourselves in the baptismal vow, 
That is why in our Sunday worship, we need to do confession every time. Deny yourself. And you see what happened, what sinful we have, and then we have to confess. And then we are asked to take up the cross. Unfortunately, we like to be a Christian without bearing the cross. In our secular culture, we are told that life is for pressure seeking, not welcoming any pains, suffering, or sacrifice. But if we are reluctant or avoid taking up the cross, we are not following Christ. We are following the world. Yet St. Paul said with no regret, I rejoice in my suffering for your sake. I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body. That is the church. Do you love the church of Christ? Now this is very important question i don't have to spend time i don't have time to talk about there are church groups to say i want to also dissociate with you and i want to be on on my autonomy how many churches do we have in history there's only one church church of christ can you dissociate from yourself to the Church of Christ? It's just a fact people don't understand ecclesiology, the Bible. Do we love the Good Shepherd Vancouver Church? It looks like these questions are talking about our choice, our favor, and our preference. But this is never what St. Paul means. Even when we say we believe in Jesus, this is not based on our choice and intelligence. As Jesus said to Peter when he confessed Jesus as Christ, and Jesus said, For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. That's not the world tell you. That's not about your decision making. That's not about how intelligent you are. But my Father who is in heaven. It's all coming from God. God inspire you. God enlighten you. So Paul said the same thing in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3b, no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Think about this. You become a Christian, you are now in Church of Good Shepherd. It's not your choice at the end. It's God's sovereignty directing you. This is what the Bible said. It is only God's grace given to us such that we can be able to know Christ and to be a member of his church. God only calls us to be a servant, his messenger, and the steward of his word for the proclamation of the gospel to the unbelieving world. St. Paul delegates life for God's calling. It's never his agenda, his favor, his will, or his plan. It is God's will on Paul as Jesus revealed himself to Paul in the conversion at Damascus. Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now I want you to think about this too. Because the scholars say, when Paul, Jesus say, why are you persecuting me? It means that when, Jesus, when Paul saw persecute Christians, saw actually persecuting Jesus, meaning that Jesus Christ felt being persecuted at, in heaven. It's not nothing about Jesus. So that's why we always say when we sin against our brothers and sisters, you also sin against God. The same analogy. And then, but Jesus later says, Saul is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Who predestinated Paul in his mission? Did Jesus know he would be one day imprisoned? and die in Lazarus, say, on the cross? Did Jesus know? 
Is it Jesus' will? But Paul said, I rejoice in my suffering for Christ, for his glory. So let me ask, are you a faithful servant for God? And respond to God by saying, here I am, send me Lord. No argument, no debate, no conditions. No preconditions. Just completely surrender to God for his sovereignty on us and on our church. That's what the Colossians said. Amen.